On? Yes? Working? I think this must just be for, yeah, the stream. Um, well, let's begin in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And Lord Jesus, we gather in your name. And as we gather, we acknowledge the Darug and Gundungurra people, the people of the plains and the mountains, and we pay our respect to their elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal people. Um, my name's Paul Stenning. I'm the principal here at Cath West, and I just wanted to say welcome and that you're most welcome. Um, I'm going to pinch Steve as an honorary member of Cath West and thank Steve for um, doing the tour and showing you around um, this place. It's probably a little bit of a different place in terms of what you see students doing on a, on a daily basis. Um, and just to see the imagination um, of students in that maker space and the sort of things that they do and the businesses that they create is a pretty um, inspiring piece. And then the other side of it is to see the students that are in, in trades, in the heavy trades and things and, and how they spend their week. It's a pretty cool thing. So um, Cath West also is a resource for the rest of the system. So as you're going around and you're chatting and you're thinking, oh, wow, how, how could we do this? Just make sure you reach out. If you haven't got my card, um, make sure you grab one, see me b before the end of the day so that you've got my number and my uh, email address, etc. so that if there's something that your school's looking for, happy to see how my team here, with the resources that we've got here, how we might be able to work together so that you can achieve what you want to achieve for your kids at your school. Um, I'm going to hand you over to Steve. Here you go, Steve. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Um, before I uh, get going as well, I'd like to welcome Mr Paul Meldrum. Um, the reason I'm pointing him out is because he was a lot of the brains behind the actual development of these sites in our schools as well. So a lot of that up-to-date thinking about learning and everything, he's the man to go and see. So if you've got time, when we get some, to questioning, please chew his ear off because I know that he's got a lot um, that's happening in our schools and it's really innovative and we thank you for your work, Paul. Um, what you're actually seeing here as well is this is a part of probably a three-year plan. We're getting closer and closer uh, to our end goal, which was inspired by Paul Stenny. Um, the idea was looking at the idea of Science Week and making it a true STEM occasion. Um, we've been, I've been actually looking at the people that are going to be talking tonight, probably not so much at myself because my wife classes me as a potato when it comes to some of these things. But the actual people that you'll be talking here tonight, you'd actually be paying for at a conference to hear. And the beauty of it is, it's this idea that Paul come up with, with having a focus on Science Week, coming together as a STEM organisation and showcasing what we're doing in our school is happening this year at CAF West. So what you're going to find, like in a second, like REA is going to give us a little bit of a talk and give us some insight into the F1 challenge. That will be here during Science Week. Okay, so there's going to be, and it's not just a secondary um, initiative as well, we're going to have a look at how the primary schools can get involved in that too. Uh, Dean Hanner, who I've known for years as well, he's going to be looking, um, show, talking to us about the bottle rockets. Really great projects, easy to run, and if all goes to plan, we hope to be running a little contest into school competition with the bottle rockets during Science Week. So, um, Lee, I've noticed that he had the mousetrap cars coming up. We were looking at that as well. So again, great to tap into his expertise and what's actually happening at Panola. And as well, we're going to have a um, um, Kelly Jarworth or Kelly... Lewis, she couldn't be here tonight, but she's actually going to show us what's happening in that senior science area. Again, um, extension science is another course that our students can actually access later on. Um, and we'll finish up with um, looking at some coding with drones, um, which, uh, again, this is where me as a potato comes in. I, I can't code for the life of me. But it is such an important school that we need to actually train our students up in. And I'm going to show you one way where I'm hoping it will generate a lot of excitement, a lot of enthusiasm, easy to do. And as well, you, um, Lisa, if you haven't known, um, is the manager of Lex. These resources are available from, to our schools to actually borrow as well. Okay, so everything you're seeing here, we've got little preparing kits, we're preparing little pro teaching programs and things. 
just to tailor it into a big science event, just to try and push our kids' interest, because um, let's, let's be honest, STEM rules the schools, and we want to make sure that they get excited and enjoy it enough. So I'm going to hand over to Lisa, because you're emceeing the night. I'm emceeing. Um, and look, can I thank you all for coming, because I know you're coming out of school time, um, and probably some people quite out of their way. So really thank you for coming, and also for anyone that's on our live stream, um, we welcome you as well, and make sure that you ask questions in the chat on live stream. We'll be monitoring that, and we can answer those questions. Um, just a couple of things to point out too is that, you know, part of this whole, you know, the, the Teach Meet STEM and STEM Mad is part of our strategy to really bring schools together to connect around STEM learning. Um, so we've actually uh, designed, one of our teams, Saba's designed this logo, STEM Community Hub logo that you'll see up on the left. So you'll be seeing that a lot more often because that will be our logo to, to bring us together. Um, and, you know, the title of this is Show and Tell, Inspiring the Future of Learning. So, and that's exactly what we're doing and really grateful to people that decide to present today and please um, when we have our next one, please feel free to share what you're doing because everyone is doing great things. Um, and then later on, we will talk about our STEM Mad event, which um, is really exciting. And I hope to also um, put a few people on the spot that were there last time to maybe just have a quick brief chat about what they got out of STEM Mad 2023. Um, okay, so what we'll do is I think we'll get started now. We've actually, which is great. Thank you, Paul. We've done it covered through this and we've gone through um, roughly the agenda but there's the agenda there. We'll, we'll start with um, Martin and Kathy um, from F1 in a minute um, and then after that we're going to um, have it, we may have a bit of a break or not, we'll see what we need. We've got some presentations, we'll talk about STEM Mad and then we've got a last presentation um, and that'll finish up the night. So, okay, so enjoy. In between the presentations, we'll have some time for questions. You will need to use the mic because it's going through to the live stream. Okay? Any questions at the moment? No? Well, I'll hand over to um, Martin. So, um, Martin Bishop, so F1 in Schools um, is a program that is running in already many of our schools. Um, and Martin's going to run through what it is, what's it all about, what it can do for students and what sort of STEM learning they can get from that. Thanks, Martin. Uh, thanks so much. Um, okay, so just to give you a bit of an insight um, as to who I am, um, I've been a teacher for 25 years. At uh, most last 10 years, I've been, no, last 14 years, I've been at Penrith Christian School. Um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with that. And uh, I began doing F1 in schools in 2017. That's when I first looked at it. And then in 2018, um, I put my first team together and we entered the competition. So everything I'm talking about and saying is coming from a teacher's perspective. It's coming from my perspective. Um, it's not coming from someone who hasn't been teaching for the last 14 years and, and doing this from ground zero. So. Um, yeah, so it's all about engaging students. One of the things why I got into this is because I was getting a little bit discontented with a few things at school, particularly for myself, but also the way I was teaching. And um, I wanted to find something different, something which would um, challenge the students, but also challenge myself in a lot of ways. So that's why I, I got into F1 in schools. I'll let you read that. I'll just read this, this small part at the bottom. It says, STEM education is about building analytical problem solving and communication skills, building capacity and facilitating the transition to um, work in the real world. What, what this means is that when I'm working with students, and this will become clear as the presentation goes, is that when I've been teaching at school, in a lot of areas, there's students which need to be excel in different areas. We know that they do maths, science, English and maths, which is STEM. Um, but I was looking at something which would push them external to that and include that as well. So I was looking at um, something which would take them close to industry, schools which are required in industry. And um, as I was going through the program, I was noticing huge changes in the students, um, which I'll talk about in a moment. 
Um, it says, STEM is a network cross-curricular um, collaborative learning environment where students transition from listening to taking ownership. And I think this is the, the really good one here. From ownership comes focus, motivation, innovation, and leadership. And if you look at the jobs of students in an F1 competition, you predominantly have a manager, you have a, a manager of marketing, you have someone in charge of graphics, you have a design engineer, which is for the cars, and then you have the manufacturing engineer. So you usually have five people in the team, and they're all responsible for their jobs. And that crosses both en enterprise and engineering. So 50% is enterprise, 50% is engineering. Um, a lot of what you see in the back here, these are the folios, and I really recommend that you come and look at these. These are world class, so these are all from the world championships. Um, these are predominantly done by year 10 students. They're about second year university level when it comes to technology and uh, the information that goes into it. Uh, the cars here, we're looking at, um, uh, from your right to left, uh, we're looking at primary school cars, which they make them out of paper or cardboard. This is cadet level, which is around about year six, year seven. This is development class. This is um, junior professional, professional, and that's a world class one. So this car here, back in 2019, was the fifth fastest car in the world. Take into account there's around about 48 countries in the world that compete in this, okay? So it's not, it's not something, it's not a game. It's, it's real, the students go through the process because it mimics what takes place in a real F1 environment. Um, hence why the World Championships is um, in the lead up to the F1 Grand Prix. This year it's the lead up to the Singapore Grand Prix. I'll talk about that in a little bit more in a moment as well. So when we're looking at the link to industry, we're looking at how do students grasp being able to talk to people in industry. And it's really important, this is one of the most important part and most enjoyable parts for me. Because obviously, when they've got a team in F1, one of the things they need to do is get some sponsorship. They don't need to get a lot of sponsorship. They just, they need some companies which will come on board with them, okay? And the sponsorship could be cash, or it could be in kind. But it's just not the relationship between the team, the students, and industry. Um, it's also about meeting and talking to people in industry. It's all about people in industry and the companies getting on board and really talking to the students in work, in, in work words. You know, whenever I go to one, um, one of my sponsors, I say, look, don't hold back. Talk as you, wouldn't in, as you do in a company. Talk as you do to your employees, without the swearing, obviously. But um, you know, I, I want the students to experience what's happening in industry and get that experience on board. And the first thing I notice with the students is that they understand what the stakeholder interest is. As soon as they get one sponsor or one company, they think to themselves, oh, wait a minute, I've got to do things differently because I'm now working for the sponsor, I'm now working for a company. Makes sense, doesn't it? You know, if you're running a real company, that's how you think. And it takes time for the students to get this on board. So it prepares students for real-world environments, business, commercial, and marketing. Um, it gives them a head start to university and more, um, and more prepared for challenges in life because of the way they're dealing with companies. And of course, if you look at what industry wants from students, it's quite extensive. And in school, there's pockets there what we do. We do problem solving, we do teamwork, we collaborate. So a lot of those things in school we do. But in this, we do them all. We do them all in the one project. And this is where it's different because the students start getting some ownership of what they're doing. Um, in class, but you know, we're all guided by the bell, okay? And when that bell goes, you move off to the next class. We have recess, we have lunch. I know some schools are different, but um, my life has been that. Bell, period, period, bell, period, and you keep going through that process. And 
it's very difficult in a lot of ways to cover all this with every student every time. You get into a program like this and it draws the students into it. And uh, again, I'll um, translate my uh, thoughts on this and my experiences with the students. Um, industry wants a specific set of knowledge and skills that not all students may acquire in their time at school. They might get in patches right across everywhere, that's fine, uh, but when you do a competition like this, and it is a competition, um, you, get to the, you get to experience all of it, and each one of the students in the team teaches each other as well as they go through it. And there's always a lot of collaboration with other years as well. And then when you look at the curriculum, um, and we, you tick off a lot of things in the curriculum that you could do in F1 in schools, um, and this is a bit of a chart, and I'm happy to, to send this out, but it gives you a bit of an idea of um, some of the skill sets that students need to go through um, when they do this particular project. Um, as I've said, if you, if you come down and look at these books here, you can see the maths, you can see the science, um, you can see the engineering particularly, and when you look at the enterprise and the marketing, um, all that comes right through in these folios. And you don't start at that level, okay? You start low. You train them low and then they come up and the students will start getting really excited once they're getting to understand the competition, once they understand what it's about. And when they start taking control of this particular project. And I think that's what we want as teachers. We want to see students take control. We want to see them think. We want to see them problem solve. We want to see them advance. But we want to do it. It'd be even more wonderful if they, if they can do it on their own. And that's what we're after. Can we motivate them to do this on their own? So F1 in schools is a real world project. Um, it is an international competition. As I said, there's you know, 44 plus schools in the world that do this. And Australia is the most successful country in the world at this. Okay, we've won eight world championships. And we just won the world championship last year from a school in Melbourne. Um, and you know, we're the leaders in the world when it comes to STEM in this particular competition. It, it means that any school in Australia has the opportunity to represent Australia at the world championships. It'd be fantastic to see a Catholic school at the world championships. It's, um, uh, it's nothing like you can ever think. Um, I, all my teaching career, I didn't think I'd experience the things which I've experienced. Particularly, I haven't, didn't think I'd experience what I'd see from the students. And the students which have left school um, at the moment from my first team, I keep in contact with them, they keep in contact with me, um, and I'm just watching how they're progressing, progressing through life. And um, I'll, I'll talk a, a little bit more about that also in a moment, because I want to sort of link a little bit between what happens in primary school and what happens at the World Championships, okay? Because for me, each one of these is a success. And I didn't get into this wanting to get to the World Championships. I, get, I got into this because I wanted to see change in students. So ground zero, ground zero is, is this car here, okay? And um, this is a, a cardboard car. Um, you can see that Kathy, what have you, what, what's the, who's the driver of this one, Kathy? Obi-Wan Kenobi. Obi Kenobi. Okay, so we're, we're getting a bit off this from the Lego. But um, this particular car here will go down the track at around about 50, 55 kilometers an hour. And the students get to start the cars and I'll show you that video in a moment. Um, you can run this at your school over one or two days. The lead up to it is, is big because you can see right down the bottom there is that you've got the problem solving communication teamwork and marketing. But as I was saying before, you can have up to three students um, in, in this particular set and they could all have different jobs. One could be, in part, could be the manager, you could have one in charge of marketing, and then you have the engineer. 
and the three of them, and then you will have a criteria because you, you want to get points. You want to you want to find out how they're going. So we have a criteria at the back of the books that you can score the students off. It's all, it's all done for you. Um, and then you can have a competition. And as a result of those competitions, okay, the students will get some feedback. They'll get an understanding of what went right, what went wrong, what they can improve on, etc. And once you get to that situation whereby they can reflect on, on what has gone right and what's gone wrong, and this is a continuous. There's, right through the project, this is, it's continuous. So the, the object is to keep improving, okay? Because you want to get to the cadet level, you want to get to the development level, and you may skip. You might have some students which you think, hey, I think these students are good enough, they'll can't jump right into development class, or you might have some students which are good enough to come straight into professional class. That's, you don't need to go through this whole process, but the process is there if you want to go through that process. So there's all different ways of tackling this and entering into it. It's, um, the engagement of students is, is very re relevant. And um, I'm about to show you a, a video now. Um, this was taken um, at a school down south. Um, yeah. And um, it's a it's a school. It was a primary school. Students, and um, they decided to do this program. And on the final day of uh, the finals, uh, about 300 parents turned up. The students were so excited about it, and uh, they wanted to come in and see what the all the excitement was about. So I'll just show you this quickly. Yeah. So that was run over two days. So you probably had um, double that over the two days for a particular school. And uh, yeah, the students loved it. The students did posters. Um, they formed teams. They got T-shirts, um, which were done in their team colours. They can do logos, um, just like we're all left racing. That's where it all starts in primary school. And the other thing which is important is that with that school there, they had um, stage three students which were training the stage two students, which were training the stage one students. So you get this interaction happening right through the school whereby the older students are passing their knowledge to the younger students. And um, a lot of the staff that run this program, particularly in public school, that's, that's the way they do it, is that they allow the students to teach the students what they learn. And I, I, I believe that's a really great way of doing it because when I come back to my story about F1 and schools is that I, as I said, I, I went and looked at the New South Wales State Championships in 2017. That was at Newcastle. And then in 2018, I started my first team. Um, we made it to the Nationals on the first year. And then I, 
I sort of put a little seed into that team, a, a lady by the name of Imogen Rogers, who was in year eight. And um, I got her to form a team the following year. And um, they made the world championships in Abu Dhabi, um, of which they came fifth, um, which was their car here. Um, and, th and they've gone on to, they have now left school, they're at university and they're very successful. Brock Stinson, um, he actually, when we're in Abu Dhabi, he got the uh, Williams Academy Award. Uh, and he still works for Williams at the moment. So he's around about a year off working for Williams in the engineering in pit lane in the F1. So that's all stemmed from the fact that, you know, we did F1 um, in that year. Then the following year, I, I got another school and then COVID hit and we all know what COVID was like. And um, I had a team called um, Ascension, which is their car here. And um, they also made the worlds. Um, they came 10th and um, this year I have a team called Eve which are three young ladies from year 10 and they've managed to make the world as, as well. So uh, it, from a female perspective they do brilliantly in this particular competition. Matter of fact my best two engineers have been female and that, that would be um, Ella Studley which was in Ascension and uh, Jada Wiley who's currently in EVE, which will become Dawn going into the World Championships. So what does the World Championships look like? Um, we've, got, we've got Singapore this year. It's in September. It's the lead up to the Grand Prix. Um, I can't wait, really looking forward to it. But this will give you a bit of a taste of what it is like. We've got to update the, um, that to um, 2022. We've got the World Champions um, Team Hydron, yes, um, from Victoria. So that's what F1's about. That's only a, a bit of a taste of it. Um, I've got these followers. I'd love you guys to come down and have a look at this and just have a look at the level that um, Australia is doing at the moment in this particular competition. Have a look at the cars and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. We are here to help you. If you've got the smallest of questions, we want to answer them. If you go back to your school and you've got questions, you just give me a call. If you want me to come out to your school and give you help, I'll come out to your school and I'll give you some help. So when this isn't a one-stop, we're out of here. Uh, we want to form this relationship. We want to... I'll get your students to experience this to the full. Like I said, success is different for different people, for different students. It's success is different to us teachers, the way you look at it. But um, I hope that when you guys have a look at all this, 
and you go back to your school with this knowledge that you would um, give it a go, take it up and just see how far you can go in F1 in schools. Martin, thank you so much. That's, that was just a wonderful... It's not uh, working. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much. Cool. Um, yeah, just hearing all about that is just so exciting for, for schools. Yes. And I know that quite a few of our schools have been involved in it as well. Um, it'd be great to hear, is any school here that has been involved in it before that could say something about it? Yep, yep, Steve. <laughs> Steve. <laughs> Um, actually, we had a couple of students at Emmaus Catholic College that entered uh, the F1 challenge as well. They were only at the year 10 level and they didn't take it further after that. Uh, but uh, three, two of them are engineers, like it was a team of three, two were engineers. One's driving sprint cars at the moment at the adult level um, and the other one will be um, looking at driving the solar car for Western Sydney University in that and he's also designed the um, steering system for it. So a lot of it's come out of inspiration and just a love for the area here. So it's been a really fantastic experience. Anyone from Parramatta Marist? I think they've been in it for the last... Sorry? Yeah? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, no, I've, we've gone up against them, so we know that they're, that's a pretty strong school at the moment, so, yeah. That's good. Um, is there any questions? Yeah, hold on, I'll give this to you. I'm just curious on logistics, do you sort of run it after school or is it actually in, in curricula? Um, no, it, mine was extracurricular. So I was in the TAS room every recess and lunch um, and after school. And le leading up to major competitions, I was also there in, on some weekends and holidays. So it is a commitment depending on what level you want to go to, but it'll also depend on what students you got as well. Um, I, I've been fortunate enough to have some students which are just machines. Um, you know, when, when I talk about uh, a, a lady like Imogen Rogers, she was still ducks of the year, but still doing this um, at a world level. So if you, you get students like that, they just keep going. But obviously, um, I make sure they have breaks. I make sure they have some switch off time and so forth. But yeah, my whole time doing this has been e extracurricular. So if you can get it into the curriculum, you're one up on me. Yeah. yeah. Um, I understand the dynamics of the uh, stage four, five, six cars, uh, but the testing of the primary school cars, like, and I'm pretty sure, the, I'm not sure if the primary school actually knows about the cylinder that goes in the back and everything. Like, is there a way to actually test that within the schools, like without having the whole track or is it... Uh, no, not really, and I wouldn't advise it. <laughs> uh, like I said, that car will go at about 50 kilometres an hour with um, a canister in the back of it. You'll notice that there's a hole at the front and a hole at the back, and that's for a wire to safely run it down the track. Um, I think, alternatively, you could probably use something on a downhill basis, but, you know, they're built for speed. <laughs> They're built to do um, a particular function. That's to go down a track really fast. So, um, yeah, it, but it's up to you. I mean, once if you haven't got a track, then you can do it on a downhill slope. I mean, I, I, I have done that with students before, but not a lot of schools have got that slope to be able to do that. But uh, that is an alternative. Um, and the way we did it is that I still ran the string through it. Probably had two or three cars in a row. Um, got the TAS department to build uh, a block, wooden block at the start, wooden block at the end, and they race down. Yeah. Steve, I think Paramount Marist, they have their own track, don't they? Um, I think there's about three tracks in the licence. Yeah. Another question here. So for our primary schools, um, how much time would they need to make one of those cars yep. so that if we were running a competition here in Science Week, they could come ready to race. Yep. 
If you're a teacher and you haven't got the instructions, it's going to take you about three days. <laughs> I've actually seen that. Um, if you're a student and you've got the instructions, you can knock it off in under an hour. Yeah. And, and, and the, the thing about it is that it's not just giving the paperwork and the car and telling them to build it and it's going to get down the track. You, you've got to take them through the journey, okay? Every, every one of these has a journey to it. So you, you want to start off by thinking about well, what makes something go fast? What, what is aerodynamics? Um, what's friction? All those, all those simple things you've got to go through um, with the students to get them to understand why they're going to build this and why they think it's going to go faster than another car. So although you restrict it a little bit here in terms of what you can do and can't do, but you know, there's nothing stopping you, you know, put a different axle on, I suppose, but it's got to be safe. So everything we, we, we give you is safe. But when you get to here, you, know, you can put on a different axle. Um, but it's got to be cut pretty much top and um, side to side because you can't uh, touch that back wing. And if you look at a milling machine, the only way you can do that is by cutting to the side and to the side. Um, and then you, you progress into here where you can put a 3D back wing on it and a 3D front wing on it. So it gets progressively harder and you can progressively do more until you get to the nationals and this is, you know, you do your own wheels, you do your own bearings, you do everything yourself. But you've got to remember that the beauty of this is that there's rules and regulations and it's a thick book. It's just like F1 racing in real. If you look at real F1 racing, before any car goes out on that track, they scrutinise it. Every car is scrutinised to the millimetre. And we do the same thing. Every car is scrutinised. And it goes through the scrutineering process and they can get penalised and get time penalties. Okay? Or we can get penalties for just doing a few things wrong. So the, all the students go through the same process. Um, until we get to the worlds and, you know, this is where it really gets serious because you're up against the best in the world. And the rules and regulations, they go up... Uh, I'll tell you what they've done this year is that the cars now look exactly like real F1 cars. Okay, they've got the halo. We've got to put a driver in there. They look identical you know, to, to the real F1 cars. So that's the new regulations this year. So every car which will be going down in Singapore is going to look like the real F1 cars. And of course, that changes things. It changes the way you think about the design of the car and how you're going to make this car go faster than another car. So there's always a journey, there's always a process. Yep. Thanks, Martin. Is there any other questions from anyone? Yeah. yeah. How long has F1, when did, what year did F1 start? I believe it was 2006. 2009, I think he came up with the idea in 2006, but he actually began it in 2008. Um, it started in the UK. Um, as a STEM project and then it uh, sort of spread around the world and uh, uh, Dr Michael Myers who uh, is the CEO and founder of this in Australia, he still runs it and um, yeah, it's uh, like I said, Australia has been the most successful country in the world uh, in this particular competition, so yeah. Hello, um, I'm from Panola Catholic College. Uh, the question I have is, I think you said that it's not in the curriculum. Uh, can it be maybe introduced somehow into the curriculum through the engineering um, curriculum where we are then getting students, I've got students doing Fusion 360, which is a program to do um, um, that kind of work where yep. students can engineer a car uh, would that be possible to maybe introduce it into that, in, in, through that perspective of the engineering uh, syllabus? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, um, just about all the um, design here is Fusion 360. So if you come down and have a look at the, a lot of the CAD work and the engineering, m most of that's Fusion 360. So you can just roll that straight into it. And um, 
and that's not a bad idea. Um, I never taught engineering, so I, I never had that opportunity. But um, if you can come down and have a look at this, you'll see that it's very relevant to that. Sorry? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, you can. Yep. All right. Is that, is that all? Um, when we have major competitions that there is a cost, um, purely um, because of the staging and what we put into it. Um, so for example, uh, the National is around about 800. <coughs> yeah. That's right. Uh, if you look at the website, we have the costing under the varying programs. Yes. There is also a link to our YouTube channel where you can view all of our events that we've run from mm -hmm. state finals to nationals to worlds. So everything is there, everything's yeah. at your fingertips. There's a number of documents that I've left yep. with Stephen. I'm happy to email them out to all of you if you're interested. It takes you from the paper car right through. And they come with kits? They can. You can purchase kits through our store. We oh, sell okay. almost everything, don't we? Um, yeah, so th these come in kits, yes. okay, and if you, there's an example bag over there. Um, so that's a kit for one car, okay, for the primary school. And then what you've got here is that these are balsa wood, balsa wood, balsa wood. So you buy the box of balsa wood um, for those, so you get um, around about 50 in a box of that. Um, they come in various weight categories. So um, a lot of schools, they save the lighter ones for the big competitions because um, they want to put more paint on them and finish them off. And the world's is foam. Similar sort of um, block size, a couple of millimetres um, longer. But yeah, that's a foam car. And um, every car in the world starts off at the same weight on the world's. Yeah. Thank you. Just one last. Yeah, that's fine. How fast does that fastest one go? <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I can tell you a story of what happened with this, but that's, that's another time. But let's just say that 48 hours before we were um, getting on the plane, um, we had uh, 10 cars and they were all destroyed. And um, that was the year Brock. I think we, we stayed up for um, 36 hours in a row, um, building another three cars. And um, when we were on the plane to Abu Dhabi, the paint wasn't dry yet. So we had them in the cabin with us and we're trying to get them to, to dry. And we had bits and pieces which were coming in from parents and it was a bit of a mess. But we got over there and um, it was overweight on the first day because the paint was still drying because of what happened. And um, the car was just getting faster and faster. So on this first run, out of 55 teams, on the first run it ran 36. On the second run it was 17th. On the third and final run it, was, it came fifth. So we kind of figured that, you know, if we had the right cars, um, we may have had the fastest car in that year. But it did get best engineer car of the, of the competition, which is probably the biggest award you can get um, other than winning it. I've yep. got some information here. Okay. The fastest recorded time, world record time set by an F1 car was an Australian team, I think it was Infinitude. 0.916 seconds. So 20 metres. Yeah. That's around about just 66, 66. Yeah. If you have a look at our national finals that we held recently in Penrith, yeah. some of the speeds that the kids can achieve and the lightning reaction on the trigger, mm -hmm. it's amazing. They're up there, they're wearing headphones to calm themselves down, they meditate, they do everything to get in the zone and they're, they're phenomenal. I only joined the company two months ago and I am blown away by what these kids are capable of. You will be too. Yeah, so um, yeah, I, I'd say anywhere between 50 and 70 kilometres an hour depending on, on the car. Yeah, they go down the track. So on average, 20 metres, um, they do around about 1.1, 1.2 seconds. Um, development at about 0.1 onto that to the professionals. Um, and it's, 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 it's funny because I have teams that turn up and say, oh, our car went under a second and all that sort of stuff. But the one thing I've learned is that you cannot 
go off times from your school because the environment changes. Like these are only 50 grams. That's the minimum weight for the professional. 52 grams for, uh, for the cadets. So when you get a change of temperature or a bit of wind or something like that, you know, it, it can change the environment. But all cars are racing in that environment. It, it makes no difference. It's, I've just noticed that, you know, no matter where I go to, we've just got to race under the conditions that you're in at that time. And it's even worse for the worlds. I mean, you going to Singapore, it's going to be, the humidity is going to be amazing. So, yeah, yeah, that's it. We've got to take all that into account. So um, when we go over there, uh, we've got to make sure that... Um, we don't sit it right on 50 grams. So we want to sit it on 50.1, 50.15 grams, somewhere around there. Um, mathematics comes into it a great deal when it comes to the weight, because weight is speed uh, in a lot of instances. If, you know, that comes back to a bit of science and all that sort of stuff. So um, we've got to make sure that we get the car as close to 50 grams as possible. And you've got to remember when you go over there, you've just got to add stickers. So you've got to do the mathematics. Well, wait a minute, if we're going to add five stickers to it, we go over there at 49.82, <laughs> then we put the stickers on, that'll give us 50.07, 50.08. Is that m as much contingency as, as we need for it to not drop under 50? Because you'll get penalised in the world if it goes under 50. For every breakage or anything that goes wrong, they'll, you get hit with a 25-point penalty. So it's pretty serious when you reach the world. You've got to make sure you, you, you cover everything at that point. Yeah. Thank you so much, Martin and Kathy, um, for coming and, and giving us your time. That's generated a lot of questions and interest. Um, when's, when's Singapore? Uh, we're heading over to Singapore on the 7th of mm -hmm. September. Um, yeah, and it starts on the 8th. Um, so, yeah, I've, I've booked the plane tickets uh, for the ladies and, uh, yeah, we're looking forward to it. But there's a lot of work to do between now and then. Um, they've got to design the cars and um, you get the marketing underway. They've changed the name from Eve to Dawn. So if you, if you want to look up the world teams and a lot of information will be coming out, um, Dawn is, is their name for the world championships. Instagram and Facebook, uh, basically just REA. It's really simple to find. You'll be able. I'll be doing a snapshot of all the world teams leading up until September. So you'll be able to see how they prepare and all the different stages, and then hopefully when they bring the trophy home. All right. Well, thanks very much, um, guys. That's really good. Really appreciate it. Um, I'll just. Um down there, thanks. Um, well, my husband, um, you know, makes model trains, but it's not quite as fast as, as doesn't run as fast as those. Um, alrighty, um, so th th that was really fantastic. So we'll just move on to, oops, move on to our next. So we've got the presentations. Um, so. Kelly Lewis, who's um, one of the science t uh, educators in CSPD, um, apologies that she couldn't be here, uh, but in fact, well, she's sharing, or while sharing her presentation on the quantal bioscience opportunities for our science extension students, and that's where she was today with the students there. So we'll go on to that, and then after that, we'll have Dean, Hannah, talking about bottle rockets, and Lee Sullivan talking about what's happening in STEM and Panola. Um, so, yep, so Kelly Lewis is actually um, with a group of students right now um, over at Castle Hill with um, our industry partner. Um, and basically, this is opportunities that we give our schools, fantastic opportunities for our students to um, learn and develop in STEM areas. And um, Kelly has a form, so once we send these slides out to you, you can register interest for your students in science extension. Um, basically, um, it, the places would be arranged in term three and for them to start in term four, okay? Um, but I'll just show you this little video that she ha has, just to explains a little bit more about the program and some of the things that you can see the students are um, involved in. I found the word 
lot of microbiology to be completely endless, completely confusing and crazy, and there's no limits to it. I'm learning new things every day. There's so many different avenues you can go down. The technologies are completely like mind-blowing. So my project is to determine whether methylotrophs have differing salt tolerances and seeing if when applied to plants, the plants would share those salt tolerances. I've been taught to look outside of the box and to explore things out of my comfort zone and to not limit myself to what I know. Um, just going through those motions has taught me a lot of skills like resilience, um, problem solving. And I've basically found out that the thing that enables drought tolerance is called proline, which is an amino acid. So I'm basically going to be using some cool um, technologies to kind of quantitatively analyse the presence of those in each of those plants respectively. Being at Quantil has opened so many different avenues for me. Um, I've been given opportunities that I didn't know were possible. I've been given incredible mentors to work with, which I've been so grateful for. Um, their experience in the field is completely unmatched and just to have somebody to discuss and bounce off ideas off of has been really amazing. Okay, so um, that's the, the Quantal Bioscience project uh, or program and Basically, your Year 11 Science Extension students would start in Term 4 just thinking about their projects, okay? And then, then they'd start in the following year. So that's where Kelly's at with the students at the moment. Um, I don't know if, you know, Paul, did you want to uh, just sort of run through a little bit more about that? Um, that's the support we've got for Science Extension. So any kids in Year 12 and they're looking for authentic science research opportunities, Quantal Bioscience is one. Um, but Quantal Bioscience is also providing us support, um, particularly we've got some schools um, that are engaging in stage five. Um, one of the research projects is on bioelectrogens. So they're small microbes that eat waste and generate electricity. And so students actually make a, a, a small microbial fuel cell which is essentially just a whole lot of mud with microbes in it, and um, those microbes produce energy. But the, the real um, microbiology comes into it in determining what microbes you've actually got. So how do you look at something and go, I wonder what microbes we've got? The only way you can do it is by genomically sequencing the microbes. So we've got year nine students doing genomic sequencing of microbes, Normally, you don't get access to that technology until, you, until you're in your honours year at university. So that's what's available to our students in Parramatta. Um, so that's why quantum bioscience is probably one that you might want to take advantage of. The other project that they've started with Cath West is called the Zoo of Pooh. So we're working with Sydney Zoo and we're going to collect the poo of certain animals that they're interested in determining how healthy their guts are, okay? So we collect the poo. We go to Quantal Bioscience. Once again, we um, work out what, what bacteria, what microbes are present in the faeces of, um, of the animal by, once again, genomically sequencing that and then writing a report to Sydney Zoo. As we do that, we then end up getting the gut health of that animal over time. So every, every couple of months, we go and do that again, do it again, we could do it again. It allows the zoo to see how the, what the gut health of their animal is like, what impact um, change in diet has on, on that. And it gives, but for our students, it gives um, them an opportunity. A lot of them are already working at the zoo, they work one day a week at the zoo, but it gives them a next level to things. So not only they're obviously interested in looking after animals and doing those things, but we're sort of just lifting those opportunities for them to actually do some actual science research. 
Um, once we get that model working, because we've only just kicked that off, our students pitched it to Sydney Zoo um, a couple of weeks ago to saying this is the service we can provide you. Um, once we get that model up and running, um, then what we can do is then spin that out to other schools that want to be involved because there's a whole lot more animals at Sydney Zoo, but then there's Featherdale Wildlife Park, there's Koala Park. Um, I know the team at Taronga really, really well. So it's, it's not just um, the animals that are at Sydney Zoo that we can um, test the gut health of, but schools can then start to adopt an, an animal at a zoo. And so we'll take responsibility for um, giving you a report a couple of times a year on how, how healthy your animal is. Um, but that's only available because we've got a partnership with Quantal Bioscience. Um, so just remember Quantal Bioscience, it might be something that um, if you're looking for authentic science research opportunities for your secondary school kids, that's one. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Paul. Is there any questions about that program? No? Look, um, when we share the slides, the information will be linked there too, so you can have a look at that. Um, and I, I commend that program because it, will, um, it just really extends our students um, into future learning. So I'd like to now introduce Dean Hannah. Uh, go to the next slide. Um, from Patricia Brothers um, about how they're using bottle rockets. So thank you, Dean. Well, uh, thanks for having me along this afternoon. Um, I just thought I'd start with a bit of background. I I've taught for 31 years. Um, I've just left the department last year to come and work at Patrician Brothers. Um, in 2008, uh, I was at Kingswood High School and uh, we had just discovered CO2 dragsters, which we call the poor man's, <laughs> poor man's F1. And um, we, were so, we were so excited about having something similar to, to the F1 program, but without all the... the I mean, I'd, I'd love to do the F1 program, but it, it depends on your clientele, really. You have to have kids that, are, that, that want to put in the work and that, that are quite bright. Um, not that CO2, you know, people do CO2 stuff and not bright, but... Um, I was there, we decided, uh, I built a racetrack and we started racing the cars and they were really uh, quite amazing. Then we got a MDX 40, we started to design the cars using uh, 3D modelling. And then the missing part for me was the fact we didn't have a wind tunnel. So I built a wind tunnel and it was able to give a sort of a rough coefficient of drag for the cars. And after all that, we, I was just looking for just something that fly. I thought it wouldn't be good to have a car that flew. Something that that could fly and go fast, just like a car. And so I came across uh, a bottle rocket launcher that was quite primitive, and it just started from there. Um, that's when I founded Excite and Educate. We I, I make these bottle rocket launchers. We've been doing that since since that since that time. Um, and the product's really matured over that time and I'm, I'm, I just want to encourage anyone who wants to provide resources or books. It's really, it's not, there's not a lot of equipment that is available to teachers and sometimes we, we're the ones that have to design and innovate and create products that we can use in the classroom. My friend Merrick Russell, I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with a power anchor, but the power anchor is a small device that they do model airplanes with out of balsa wood. And these two products have been done by teachers. And I think teachers are in a unique position to make things that are really w well thought out and well understood and designed for the environment. That's all I want to say about Excite and Educate. But why I like uh, bottle rockets, there's, there's a, a stack of reasons. How do we get... Oh, there we go. Um, what, what I really like about bottle rockets is that they're really, they're engaging, they're fast, they, they make a lot of, well they don't make a lot of noise, they go, they, they, they travel fast, they're really a student-centred program. 
Um, the, when we introduce that into the classroom, the kids are really, the kids are really excited to do it. It's really a, a really great problem-based task for you to, to give the students. Um, I usually start off with showing them the models of what you can make. So this, this bottle rocket has got um, the fins that are over the back of the nozzle area. Um, I show them next some fins that are just put on the back of, of the rocket like that and they're actually swept back. Um, there's a number of different designs. This is based on the, the NASA Space Shuttle. So you can put a, a sort of rubber ball in the end. Um, this one is called a ring fin, where there's, it just sits out of the back. This is available from Bunnings for quite, quite, uh, yeah, quite a cheap price. Yeah, so there's all different types of bottle rockets. So it's really, there's, um, there's a lot of uh, opportunity for the kids to innovate, to change. Um, this one is one that spins like a bullet. Um, yeah. It's very cost effective. Uh, uh, the launch is quite cost effective, and particularly after you buy the equipment, the bottle, the bottle rockets are about three dollars a head for, for kids to to purchase uh, the yeah the the bottles. Um, the bottle rockets really provide you a, a good opportunity in terms of hand skills. So. Um, if your, school do, if your school doesn't have a CNC, uh, sorry, it doesn't have a laser cutter, it doesn't have a 3D printer, then you can do all this from scratch. You can do this all, all this by hand. And what I usually do um, is that to create the bottle rocket fins, I just get them to create a cardboard template and it's all traced out by hand. At Patrician Brothers at the moment, we don't have a laser cutter. So this is an ideal opportunity uh, to go back to some hand skills. Um, if you do, so all you need is basically a bandsaw um, and a bobbin sander if, if you want to if you want to go down that track. If you do have technology, then what I do is that I model the the bottle rocket in. I use Onshape at the moment, and it's a really good collaborative tool. You can the kids can share the models with you. The kids can then create a DXF, and then you can laser cut your fins. If you have a three D printer as well. Um, I, what I've done with some of these ones is that I've 3D printed the nose cone. I've also 3D printed the way the fins are the, attached to the bottle rockets, so you can use 3D printing there. Um, I've also 3D printed fins as well, but they haven't, they tend to break a little bit as well. So 3D printing, if you, but if you don't have a 3D printer, you don't need a 3D printer. You can just um, avoid that. The other thing I've discovered um, by chance is um, all the sticker work that you see on the bottles here, they're all done with a laser cutter and it's all done using um, gaffer tape. So you put a couple of layers of gaffer tape on concrete form ply and you can do all the decorations, the logos, the flames uh, to decorate your bottle rockets. Yeah. Um, what else we here? It's a really good curricular fit, bottle rockets. They fit into design, they fit into stage five engineering. Um, it addresses lots of good engineering concepts like pressure, centre of mass, centre of pressure, aerodynamics, um, designability, um, sorry, sustainability, safety, recycling. And the other thing we talk about with um, the kids is the bottle rocket comes with two different size nozzles. There's a smaller one and a larger one. So you can propose, well, what happens if the water escapes really quickly as opposed to what happens if the water escapes slowly over a longer period of time? So it gives you um, things that they can think about and, yeah. And it's very, what I like about it is also easy to determine the winners. So you, you, I give in my, in, in my class, I give every, every student a nozzle and a cap. And I say, if you lose it, then you can't launch. So that sorts out them losing it. But everyone gets to launch. And it's very easy to determine your winner. And it's quite a straightforward process for that. Um, 
I'm not sure if everyone knows, uh, St Steve Delaney and Brian Barter and myself started this competition called the AAVC competition. Uh, is this going to work if I... Oops. How do I get that back? This is... Can you get that? Yeah, OK. Good on. This is the AAVC competition which we... Are to design oh. the winning rocket. Using simple household okay. R and wide to design the winning rocket. Using simple household items such as bottles and hot glue guns, students created flying masterpieces. It's all about rockets, planes and drones and the kids designing, experimenting, testing and improving. And as you've probably seen, there's a lot of innovative uh, additions to their design ideas this year. The Aeronautical Velocity National Championships is an opportunity for primary and high school students to put their engineering knowledge to practice. We've picked a rounder nose cone as we found out it flies better, as a, better than a pointed one. We use an exact weight of glue tack at the top which weighs out pretty well and we've stuck with the same design the whole way through. But more importantly it is about team bonding and having a good time. We're not here to win, we're not here to lose, we just came for just for some fun. Teachers say the challenge helps prepare students for the workforce, giving them a chance to develop their problem solving skills. Starting to see the use of data loggers and other technologies that even today have started replacing some of the roles of our judges. Uh, if we don't teach our kids how to do those things, well it'll be robots controlling us instead of the other way around. The competition will continue tomorrow. Katie Gallagher, Win News. Competition will continue tomorrow. Katie Gallagher, Green yeah. News. Yeah, so some, some of the best... Um, <clears throat> the competition hasn't run for two years, but we are planning to get it back up and running. But now that I'm in the Catholic system, I'm hoping to um, get a competition up for other, other, other Catholic schools. There's all the stuff here. What's good about uh, rockets is that there's all... Uh, uh, I'm a big SpaceX fan and Starship and so I've been following the, 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 the inaugural Starship launch but there's all that stuff around Starship and SpaceX. There's Relativity Space who's done the world's first 3D printed rocket which, which went very well. Um, there's got some links there, alternate fuels, we, you know, I say to the kids, why, um, what happens if I don't put anything in the bottle rocket? What, um, how far do you think it's going to go? So we talk about that, and we actually um, pump it up and, and let it and let it go. Then we then we put a tiniest amount of water, and we say, what, why why has it gone so much far further with just a tiny amount of water? And we talk about force equals mass times F equals ma, and talk about the the density of your water versus air, and and that's a hard concept to get around to get across actually, but the kids <coughs> actually get into it. We also talk about what happens if you have no, no fins on the rocket at all and why the rocket spins because your centre of mass is... It, and your centre of mass aren't in the correct relationship. Um, you, what I like about this, just rounding up, is that it's a really a student-centred uh, project. I sit back a lot and make them do it. The kids who turn up, uh, like to the, to the AAVC competition, they're... They've got all these jigs and they've, they've got all sorts of fantastic ways of getting the bottle, bottle rockets perfectly round. So there's a lot of creativity similar to the F1 kids who've, you know, got all sort of jigs and stuff that they've developed because they're so interested in it. All right, that's... Um, there's some Dropbox resources there. That's got um, all sorts of things. It's also got a guy... <coughs> um, compressed air can be quite dangerous. Uh, can be, but there's a, there's a couple of YouTube clips of um, a guy with bottles filled with air strapped to his back. And the kids don't think it's going to do much, but it actually chucks him, <laughs> chucks him way out um, into the water. And I try and use that to show the kids that it's, it's fun, but, uh, you know, you, we, we've got to be this side of the rocket and no, you can't catch it. I don't like them catching. <laughs> catching. I know it's fun, but uh, I don't like doing that. All right, well, that's, uh, I don't like talking for a long time.
No, neither here or in the classroom. So if you've got any, any questions. All right, thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Dean. That's, um, That's all right. Sounds fantastic. I bet the students love it as well. Um, and, and one thing I'm thinking of too, that you're talking about a lot of things around um, perhaps having to laser cut or do yeah, different yeah. things like that, which often is in our secondary schools. Yes. But, you know, ha were you involved in some of the schools you were at, and I'm sure some of them schools here, is it partnering with some of the primary schools? Uh, yeah, we're, we're happy to do that. What, what's good about the launcher is that if you get it, you can always uh, run um, primary school feeder programs. So you can, you can get the kids over and you can... You can actually pre-build them, you can splice them, and the kids just put fins on them and then they can take them home. Okay. Yeah, so, so it's a good way of doing that. Yep, so it's not a barrier for our primary schools at all, no, is it? No, no. And they don't have to have a lot of technology. If they just want to all do it by hand, they can. Okay. I've got a number of primary schools that have purchased them, but not a lot of primary schools, but they, they, do, they do get them, yeah. Cool. So any questions from anyone? Um, well, I will add one thing. Steve and I were talking today about um, investing in one so that we could loan it out to schools, sure. um, or at least one. Um, so we'll, we'll be looking into that so that we can do that. So we might be calling on you, Dean, to Thank you. you know give us a bit of support in that area. So um, is there any other questions? No? I, I think they just, they've got all their information because it was such a great presentation. So thank you. That, so that, Yep. Who wants to be involved in that? Hands up. Yep, there we go. There's a few people there. Yeah. Yeah. There. No, I mean, yeah. Excellent. I mean, currently I, I have a graphics class at, at British and Brothers, which, and I've introduced that, the bottle rocket into that, uh, because it's, I, I don't focus on the engineering, I just focus on the decoration of it and just the basics to get it, to get it to get it into the air, but yeah, never let um, the curriculum get in the way of a good learning opportunity, <laughs> I say. <laughs> love it, love it. All right, so thank you very much. Do you mind handing over to oh. Lee or Mike, um, and I'll introduce Lee. Um, so I'll just get you onto the, the right slides. Hold on, just escape from that. That's a bit better, I think. Um, okay, so uh, introduce Lee Sullivan from Panola and telling us all about what's happening in STEM at Panola. Thank you, Lee. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Lee Sullivan. I am at Panola um, and have been doing STEM for a while. Some of you might recognize me from the previous one. Um, but uh, I'm going to be presenting um, what uh, we are doing in STEM. Um, so, oh, wait, hold on. Sorry, wait. Um, Typo. Uh, what it should say, <laughs> what am I doing at STEM? <laughs> um, I don't know if you guys have the same sort of issue. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's a bit of a joke there. Uh, learning intention. So what are we after today? Uh, hopefully we're all here to improve the learning outcome for our students in STEM. We um, also want to encourage others in the teaching of STEM. I dragged along my colleague, Zandro, over here. Um, how do we know we're being successful? First of all, um, I'm going to identify, and hopefully you can identify some challenges facing STEM. You'll be able to describe some uh, strategies that are currently in use, and hopefully you'll leave here feeling a bit more confident in STEM teaching, which is what we're aiming for. Um, the first thing we need to talk a bit about is uh, what do we mean by STEM? Because, um, and I believe Stephen went on a, a, a big rant last time um, about what STEM means. Um, geography teachers, woot! Uh, anyway, so, uh, first of all, STEM is science. Hands up if you believe that is true. <laughs> STEM is not science. The amount of times I have been at presentations and seen uh, STEM and science being used at the same time, it's not, okay? Uh, STEM is not science. Um, it does have some science in it, yes, uh, but it's not just science, so you just can't plug and play. So then, therefore, uh, STEM is just science, technology, engineering, and maths all at once. Hands up if you think that's the case. 
Ah, see, now everyone's getting smart. Uh, science, uh, it is not just STEM, technology, engineering, and maths all at once. True story. I was having a conversation with some of my hizzy teachers, uh, Hoot, uh, and um, I said to them, oh, you should really come to this presentation. It's going to be really cool. We're going to get to see some stuff, um, and you should do some STEM. And um, she goes, yeah, look, STEM's not just for me. I'm not, I'm not a STEM teacher. And I said, well, what do you mean? Like, you know, and she goes, well, look, you know, science. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not good at science. T in technology, I'm not good at technology. E, English, I'm not an English teacher. And uh, maths, and I just kind of went, come on, people. Um, but uh, STEM at Panola addresses more than just the academic subjects. Uh, we try to teach those uh, personal attributes, AKA, 21st century skills and what employers often call the employability skills. So keep that in mind. STEM is not something that you need to um, be tied down to. Look, I'm a Japanese geography teacher doing STEM, um, and you can see that it can be integrated in a lot of different projects. So feel free. Um, so what do we do at Panola? For stage four, uh, we try to integrate our STEM projects into our TAS mandatory classes. So we do the bottle rockets, um, and it is a fantastic project, and kids really enjoy it, and we really hardly don't use any technology, you know, scissors, cardboard, gaffer tape, duct tape, um, and then this little beauty uh, that we use all the time, and it is a really fantastic project. Um, what else do we do? Mousetrap cars, um, and so we do that with our mousetrap cars in year eight. Uh, we teach them a bit about that, and then of course from the mousetrap cars, we push into the F1 in schools, and so we use this as a gateway drug into F1 in schools, um, and the kids get involved, and we've got a track, and we race them, so it, it's, it's a lot of good um, things that happen. And then of course we do um, an all accessible playground, um, which we do, this is another STEM project, um, which is very successful. So if you'd like to talk to me uh, about any of those, I'll happily talk with you and share some of the resources behind that. Um, when we go to stage five, stage five, we open it up uh, with our design and technology. Uh, so this year we've um, started a DNT class. In previous uh, incarnations, we used what was called P-Tech, which is uh, Pathways in Technology, not Panola Technology. Um, but anyway. Uh, and, um, yeah, that's a good little project. Right now, we are working on designing street libraries, so kids are designing that. We've done designing chocolate bars, which I hope we can use your vacuum former molds to do that with. Good. Yeah, it's good. Um, and then with our elective geography, uh, we go out to Sydney Water, we check out with them, we go out to the Penrith Lakes, uh, we uh, interact with those partners and have a really good project with them. Um, when we do agriculture, we designed a chicken farm. Um, we used the chicken caravan in the STEM MAD last year, uh, which we didn't win and we're not holding any grudges for. Uh, and then uh, maths this year, I actually have a maths teacher who I've kind of roped in, um, and she's going to be doing some math projects. Basically, they're pretending to be, um, it's a lower end math class, and they're presenting um, as a business, so they get to redesign and redecorate their room, and they have to calculate how much paint they're going to use on their walls, how much floor they're going to use, if they're going to carpet, if they're going to do that, offcuts, all that sort of stuff. So we're kind of working that into a real-world project. And that's the key, I think, for STEM, is that you really push into it's a real-world project that will have uh, implications for their um, jobs in their life. And that's what's, what I would suggest if you're going to be doing any STEM. Um, anyway, because you guys have been here late, I'm going to kind of pull my presentation short a bit now. So if you have any other questions at all, at all I'll happily share some thoughts and some stuff with you guys. But um, like I said, all of these resources, the bottle, the F1, um, the master up cars, they're really good and worthwhile doing. So thank you for your time. Um, and like I said, if you have any questions, I'll happily answer them. Thanks, Lee. Um Thank you again for sharing because um, they're always interesting presentations and just I think showing the things that you're doing in schools and tying into everything that we've talked about today is really valuable. Um, is there any actual questions for Lee at the moment? So do you find, Lee, does Panola partner with some of the primary schools as well? So we used to, yeah, uh, but pre-COVID, um, post-COVID, we're still trying to sort of recuperate on that. We um, used to do um, 
I think the bottle cars, the bottle rockets, we used to bring some of the primary schools in, so Our Lady of the Way and mm. a few other ones. Uh, we have a bunch of spheros, so we did a maze runner project where uh, we'd invite the primary schools in um, and they'd interact with us and do spheros. We introduced the kids in for Makey Makey, I don't know if you guys have those, mm -hmm. um, but the Makey Makeys that we use is really good and so we invite primary school students in to sort of interact in uh, year seven. So yeah, there's a lot of opportunity for those of you guys if you want to reach out. To us, we, we will run some interactions with them. Okay. Well, that's good to know. That's really good. Um, and, you know, a reminder that we've got, Lex has a lot of that equipment, the Spheros, um, the Makey Makeys that we can loan to schools, and obviously we'll be getting a few other things as well, so um, don't forget that. So, yeah. Is there anything else anyone wants to ask Lee? No? Not at the moment? Thank you so much, Lee. Um, thank you. Um, okay. So... All right, we're just going to go on to just talk about STEM Mad, but before I do that, I'd like to know who here has entered a STEM Mad project for this school? Okay, so quite a few people. That's great, that's really good. I'm here to tell you it's not too late, okay? So if you haven't and you're interested, it's going to be very, very exciting. So. First of all, what I'd like to share with you is you'll have access to all these resources. Um, we've got a couple of videos. So if you just even think you need to get some of your students excited about it um, to get them and thinking about what they could do is I'm going to play this one, just this one, which is the secondary one. Um, the primary videos are there too, so let's just play this. Attention all secondary school students. STEM MAD competition is a fantastic opportunity for you to unleash your creativity skills in the fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. This competition encourages you to think outside the box and come up with innovative solutions to real-world problems. You will have the chance to collaborate with like-minded peers, develop your teamwork skills, and engage in hands-on learning experiences. The competition culminates in a showcase event where you will present your projects to judges, competing with other schools for prizes and recognition. You might even be selected to represent your school at National STEM MAD. This year's competition promises to be even more exciting, challenging, and rewarding than ever before. So, if you want to be part of an exhilarating event that can kickstart your STEM career, don't hesitate to get involved in STEM MAD. It's time to unleash your creativity and make a difference in the world. Talk to your teacher or science coordinator now and be part of something amazing. See our website for more details. All right. So, we've got one for primary as well. So, specific video. We've got our launch video and we've got our website. Okay. Um, so, sorry. Um, so I want to get you excited for the people, so the people that are going to be, be here, but also for the people might be thinking, well, you know, we actually have some work that we're doing. And one of the things we've talked about is that it's not about you doing extra projects. You may already be doing something that could fit into this. So reach out to us if you're not sure. Um, Steve and I will have a chat with you about it, or Kelly from the science team, or Pete Blanche, right? But to look forward to it, we're going to have... Um, the Marx Institute, uh, um, Brain and Behavioural um, Development, they're going to do a keynote. Um, it's going to be really exciting. Um, all the students will be showcasing their work. Uh, we'll have the F1 challenge here. We're going to have bo bottle rocket challenges, the coded drone challenges, and a lot more. So it's really going to be a fantastic day. This is the first time that we've been able to do it face-to-face -face, um, for CSPD, so it is going to be fantastic. And we really would like a lot of schools to be involved in it. We've already got quite a lot, but we want it to be big. Like, the, the beauty of it is to connect and share and the students learn from each other. So, um, please, you know, feel free to sort of uh, register. It's not too late to do that. Um, so, to give you a bit of an idea of the timeline is, you know, even if you're not quite sure about the project yet, that's fine. Just put your EOI in, um, in the form that's on the website. Um, and it's not until week 10 that you need to submit your initial video entry, which then we give you a bit of feedback um, about, and then they get to actually improve it and resubmit, okay? So you've still got plenty of time to do that. We will have the showcase here on the 16th of August. Thank you, Paul, um, for hosting um, uh, Kath West here for it. It's gonna be great here. Um, and then from that, there'll be the winning entries and we'll pick some schools to go to national. 
Um, and I'd really appreciate if, um, I think we've got Tali here, would you mind speaking about what it was like to be at National because they went to National last year. So I'll just pass that to Saba. To so um, we had four schools selected um, to go to National. Uh, this year I'm hoping to take five schools to National out of our um, out of the, the students that are there on um, the 16th. So, yep, so what, how did you, what did you think the students got out of it, Tali? Just check, is it on? Ah. Uh, we'd done the competition for the two years. Um, and the year before, we made it through to nationals as well, but it was online. So it was a very different experience for us. And I think just being there and having the students be able to showcase, it's very different when you're putting together a three minute video to the actual day being down in Melbourne, which I think will be similar to what we're doing this year, um, here, where they actually not only had their video, but they could also showcase their learning and interact with the adults and the other students, sharing their knowledge, but also being able to see all of the other projects that were there, all of the different technology um, and all of the different ideas. Great, thank you, Tali. Uh, It was, it was. It was a really, really great event. So, um, it, is there any questions about STEM Mad? Anything that's, you know, someone's thinking of it but they're not sure? Any questions? Well, you know you can reach out to any of us in the teams, okay? Um, like I said, we'll share the slides with you. Um, please, if you haven't already put a project in this time, um, we encourage you to do it. We do have quite a number of entries now, but we want this to be big, don't we, Paul? Yeah, so, all right. So, I will leave it there um, because I'm really looking forward to this next presentation. I want to give Steve plenty of time um, to talk about coding drone because he sh gave us a bit of a snippet of it just before we left and now I want to know the whole story. <laughs> Here we go, Steve. Thank you. Um, one thing with STEM Mad as well, you've probably already got projects in your school that are done. Like, you know, there's... I. I like I'm lucky enough to move around between schools, and some of the work our kids are doing, they'd be good enough for STEM Mad. So, if there's an ex a bit of excellence, let the kids come in, let them shine on the day. Um, now, oh, here we go. Here's the test. Oh, I got it. Okay. Um, if I've mentioned a couple of times when it comes to computing, and especially with coding, like I've been called a potato many a times, I I struggle with coding. I really, really do, and I don't enjoy it. And then you get to stage four technology and I have to teach it. It drives me bananas and I've been looking for an answer for quite a while. Um, just on the side note there, if you know the ones and the zeros in the matrix, it actually is a recipe for sushi. Um, so that came out the other day, I thought it was nice. But let's just go back here and have a look at this. Like, how's this for an algorithm? Like, how good is that? Like you have, a, oh look, you know, oh, create a new drone object and then, oh, then we define the callback function. Look at that, connect to the drone, you've got to do that. And then, oh, look, you know, algorithms are brilliant. When you, but then you can actually then turn it into code. And then like, you know, it's like import necessary modules, import time, import telopy. I don't know what that means. Create a new drone object. Like, this stuff is really, really, really good, and that's about where I fall asleep. <laughs> okay. Like, I, I don't know about you guys, but like I said, I find coding so hard and so difficult that I'm lost. The other thing I actually find with coding as well is that um, if I don't see an, a, a response straight away, I've got no idea what it's talking about. Changing a little bit as well, like we went to um, the, the new um, institute down in... Um, Westmead, and I went into one of the greatest um, labs there that they've got for uh, biomedical education. And straight away, what do you see on the screen? All coding. So I realised that I'm at a disservice for my students if I actually don't do the work. So here are these little drones that we've actually got. 
And essentially, well, like, I'm just going gonna, gonna to start here. And I'm going to want it to actually fly, like, come up to about this height. I'm going to make it go about a metre. If I want to show off, I might get to do a flip. I could actually get to, get to take a photo of Mr. Stenning as well, and then it's going to land. Okay, so again, up 100, out 100, flip, photo of Paul, land. Okay, if I come back to that, that's my algorithm. And I've walked through it. Walked through it. So actually, it makes a bit more sense now what I'm actually looking at here. So, can I just... Um, free program. Okay, it's downloadable on the net. It's actually a free program that you can actually get. And this is block-based as well as Python-based. So you've got different ways that you can actually do it. Block-based for me, especially in stage four, I'm learning, kids are learning, want them excited. I'm going to stick with the block. So here, motion, oh, take off. Drop it in. Okay, motion. Come on, okay, I'll just do it this way. Motion, uh, forward 100 centimetres. Motion, I'm actually going to get it to flip, front flip. And then on motion, I'm going to get it to take a photo of Paul Stenning. Motion, land. Right, to me, I... I walked it through, I've now got this, I can understand it. <coughs> Let's see. Now the way that these actually work, this is from a company called She Drone, and they're quite a little, uh, they're a little Queensland initiative that they started. Again, run lots of competitions and things like that. We've got one set already at Lex that's going to be coming out to schools as well if people are interested. So now this is actually, uh, I the light block. I can just go back to the settings. Settings. Wi Fi. Done. Now, if I was in a class normally with coding, that's it. Brain gone. Can't work. Come back on. Green lights flashing. There's a drone here. Uh, Paul's over there. I want to make sure I get this photo right. <laughs> okay. Tap to start. Up 100. Head towards Paul. Flip. Take a photo. <laughs> okay. So, um, anyone that's actually interested, uh, let me just clear that there. Uh, if you, we actually have this for sale in the offices, <laughs> you're walking out tonight. Uh, it's a nice... <laughs> we, he signed the privacy forms <laughs> earlier, didn't he? <laughs> okay, look, to prove who hates coding here and who wants to give this a quick go, just to demonstrate that I'm not a fraud. Come on, why the only one hates coding? You're kidding. Come on, it's all go. Beautiful, thank you. Okay, so I'm going to step it up though a little bit. Clear this. Probably shouldn't have given it to me, but. <laughs> this is, I mean, I, I had drones at Marsden, which I started off with, and I was going to do game design and stuff, but um, yeah, okay. Okay, so... I don't mind coding, but it's really, like, it's the kids that don't like it. <laughs> I don't mind it as much. <coughs> yeah. Well, well, that was the... Anyway, bringing coding into schools, I thought, <laughs> was a bit of a mistake, but... It's, it's great, for, great for some kids. I mean, I did... Um, we did the uh, first robotics competition at Marsden. We got into finals and all that, but our, our team would have one or two coders that were, mad, they were crazy good, but everyone else was just, yeah, that was just left to the one or two 
kids, and, and that's the problem with coding in schools. Though. It's, it's just a whole lot of kids that are, it's just, it's just, it's just not them. And, and we did Blockly and stuff, you know, that sort of stuff, but. Now, of course I knew Lee was here. Of course I knew he was a geography teacher. So these actually, the kid actually, come, the kid actually comes with a map. So you can see now there's a whole lot of new complexity here that we can actually work out with kids. Geography, coordinates that they're actually going to be pumping into it. Like there's all sorts that we can actually do. So this is a little map of Sydney. You can get Melbourne or other cities itself. Okay, so where do we want Dean to take off from? Circular key. Okay. Well, it's controlled airspace down there. <laughs> <laughs> so he's got that in circular key, which is, oh, there's a ferry terminal there. Okay, so what I want you to do, um, let's fly over the naval airbase. And then I'll yeah. get you to land. That's the plan. Yeah, that's the plan. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get you to land. Oh, look, we actually see here. What's what this is? Oh, that's a dog track. Dog track. That'll do. Harold Park. Harold Park, that's it. Okay. Right. So here, if you want to grab that iPad, let's help him out here. All right. What's the first motion he should do? Take off. Take off. Okay, so yeah, click sure. on motion. Take off button, so you've got to slide it across and then tap it into right. the block. Yeah. So lock it in. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, okay, yeah, 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 okay. So that's going to come up about knee high. To turn it, it's called yaw. So how many degrees, like we're here, and I want to go there. How many degrees do you think roughly? Oh, no, 40, 45. Well, oh, sorry, okay. Drone's facing this way. So it's about... It's about 95. About 95, okay. So we want a your, your right. Your right, okay. Okay, slide it across. And change that to 95. Yeah. Okay. okay. Right. So then, that's about... 80 centimetres, so forward 80 centimetres. Was it motion? Was it motion? Yep, motion. Forward. 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 Oh, yep. Yep, so drag that across, lock it in. Yep. Change the 100 to 80. Yep. Okay, so we're now over the naval base, we'll have a look at that. Take a photo, but we won't, this won't be good. <laughs> so I'm now this way, and I've got to go over there to the dog track. So it's turn right or something, is it? Your right. Oh, your right. Your right or my right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> your right, so that's, that's, that's right. 90... 135. Oh. 135 degrees, there we go. So your right, yep. 135. 135, yeah, this is good. One, two steps, so I would say it's about... Oh, it's... Oh, about 150. So forward 150. Forward, yeah. Oh, sorry. And then we want to land. Alright. Okay. I should what's land. The, what's the program we're using to? So, Tello Education. It's a free program. Yeah. I mean, this, th this came out and, and got cancelled. This is the same thing I opened. And I thought this is great. And then the, the thing, we had iPads and all that stuff, right? So, so, tap the size. Oh, yeah. <coughs> I'll be careful. These things are a little bit dodgy. Those up there are good. But I'll be missing out. Thanks, Ariana, for coming to no. see <laughs> Running mission. Oh, Take one. I just press play. What do you. Press up the top of the tap to start. Oh, hang on a second. Uh, Stop. Oh, sorry, it's going through. Why is it going? Stop. Let's have a look here. Flat, is it? Um, one flat. That's 
Sorry, so how much um, um, are the drones? Are they a couple of hundred? I think the kit was oh. the kit of ten. Oh, ten so drones. Ten drones with a kit. Was was it about three thousand? Three thousand. Yep, sorry? Three thousand nine hundred? Do they carry payload in any description? <laughs> <laughs> what, Maccas or something like that? <laughs> oh no, marshmallow. You could set them on fire and drop them. <laughs> I was thinking out loud. <laughs> Be Not happy. No, oh, I'm now on firmware version. What's what's that about? Mm. Wi-Fi connection. Mm. Oh, This is where all our problem solving skills come into, isn't it? That's all right. Sorry, guys. I say. Persistence is a skill as well, Steve. See if people go. Wi Fi not connected. So, in your kit, then you would have um, 10 of those. Yep. So, with your kit, you'd have 10 of those. And you would then have 10 iPads or the kids, the children at school would have to have the iPads and can, or can they run on a desktop device? You can do it off the phone, but the way that we've set it up at Lex is that we'll uh, tie these to an iPad. So we'll give you a full kit with iPads and drone and map. Right, okay, thank you. Um, you're all right, 90 degrees. Um. Look, that's still on discussion, but most times we, we do Motion. something like half a term or a term. It depends on the projects that you're running. We're really flexible. <laughs> <laughs> How long do you want it for, Dan? Well, it's a problem. I mean, one of the reasons why I talk about Be long enough? Um, yeah, possibly, yeah. Yeah. So that's about usual, isn't it, Bernie? Yeah. I, I, um, Sorry, Lisa. Yeah. Could they take footage of bottle rockets? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they could. Actually, it is the Yeah, you, you could strap the drone to the rocket. Yeah. So, because we had our our year sevens today coding Scratch, and they were coding um, or designing a game where they were um, having this Ukrainian and Russian airplanes all <laughs> dropping bombs on Zelensky and Putin. So it's quite bizarre, but it was similar to what you're suggesting with the drones and the, and the marshmallows. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> but instead of marshmallows, they were using missiles. But that's the year sevens in my mm -hmm. class today. Yeah. Well, not anyway. no. People, I apologise. There's obviously like a hiccup here somewhere. Um, Dean did do all the right commands and everything. Um, it should be taking off. There's something that I'm still to learn. Um, Look. One of the backflips I put in. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you you showed us anyway. Yeah. yeah. So the, um, I'll just show you one other thing here. This, which, oh, no. And look, we'll it's a great photo of Andrew. So we're still in the photos of Andrew too, by the way. But the, the main thing is, like, when the time comes as well, as part of um, the Lex thing, we'll come out with you as well to make sure that we walk you through the actual software and how it works. And when you get to little bugs like this, by then uh, we'll hopefully have them ironed out so it should be quite straightforward as well. But enhancing what Lee said, STEM's not only just for um, science, math, technology and engineering, we can use it across the, in lots and lots of different ways. Does the software do simulation as well? So yes, yeah, it does. So you actually, so actually fly through, or you actually fly for real? Yeah, so um, let me see if I can get it back to the start, return. Um, yes, yeah, so basically what we're planning on doing, coming back to the uh, coming back to the um, STEM week, we'd probably like set up a course um, and based on that course we'll give the students some actual time to walk the course, code it, and then see if they can fly it one closest to the landing spot after they've gone through a hula hoop over here and under a bridge there. Um, we'll sort of be the Parramatta Diocese winner of um, drone for that year. So again, a lot of this, the Science Week stuff are going to be hopefully trophies, big celebration for what, for the, what the kids are actually doing. Um, but yes, sorry, yes, simulation. <laughs> Is there any other questions for Steve about that? Yeah. Look, these, I mean, these are things we, we get in and we, we work through them all, so we'll work out what's going on. Um, but exciting things that we've got, resources and things for schools. So make sure you contact us any time that you, even if you just want to know what we've got, because we're getting new things in all the time. Um, and this will be fantastic, I think, for schools. Um, and especially with the fact that, and talking to Steve about the fact that it's block coding, but then for those students that we want to extend it, you, they can do it in Python as well. So, um, you know, it's, it's quite flexible for their learning. So, um, is there anything you wanted to add before I... No, I just think, like, with, please, with um, STEM MAD, you've already probably got projects can, that have already been made that are ready to go for STEM MAD, so please be a part of the celebration. It's a, a dream coming true for a number of us, like this big celebration, so be a part of it. Yeah, be part of the inaugural face-to-face um, -face STEM MAD, right? You don't want to miss it. Um, so... I would like to thank, first of all, I'd like to thank Paul um, for hosting, again, allowing us to be here. And please um, thank your IT people, um, Jonathan and Bradley, who really, really appreciate the setup and all your staff that help to set up things. Um, whenever we ring them, it's all just very easy, like, how can we help you? Um, all our team at Lex, because they did a lot of work, so all our multimedia, Saba, Bernie, um, Steve, everyone, Damien, so all, our whole team and the science team get involved to do this, but also our presenters, so thank you, Lee, um, thank you, Martin, thank you, Dean, um, and also Kelly, I know she wasn't here, but she, she wanted to be here. Um, so we just thank you all for coming as well. Um, we're really looking forward to our STEM MAD, um, and we're continuing, like we said, there'll be more teach meets, won't there, Steve? Yeah, as we go on, so probably our next teach meet so we want to keep this connection going for people. Um, your feedback. So, you know, if you have some feedback, um, please email us. If there's something you want suggest or you think would could run better or you want something added to it, let us know. But I'd like you to um, just, you know, go home and thank, thank you so much for your time. Um, if you wanted to, I know Martin um, and Kathy have got some of the um, things down here that you can have a quick look at just before you go. So please feel free. So thanks everyone. Thank you.